So let's start Grand Rounds today. Uh, thank you all of, thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Michelle Brooks, who's here all the way from Virginia Commonwealth University and VCU Health, where she's an assistant professor and academic hospitalist and an expert in social media and technology and how it can be used in resident and medical student education. And so we're delighted to have her come uh, to talk about Twitter in the time of coronavirus. Dr. Brooks. Thank you so much for having me um, for that nice introduction. Yep, coming all the way from Richmond, Virginia, where it is very rainy today. Um, I'm, my talk is titled, Twitter in the Time of Coronavirus, Harnessing the Power of Social Media in Medical Education. And I hope to get through all of these things. I sent this outline to your chiefs, hoping they would pick, you know, three, maybe four, and they said they were interested in all of the things. So hopefully we can get through all of them. Um, I also sent some objectives that I don't want to read through, um, but hopefully you received those in your grand rounds announcement as well. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm not paid by Twitter or anyone else to really do this. Um, I will be live tweeting during the presentation. It will be, it will be very, uh, you'll be wondering how I did this. So uh, it, um, they're all scheduled before. That's the trick. But uh, you can follow at Michelle Brooks, um, and those two O's are zeros if you already have a Twitter account. Um, and then you can also follow and use the hashtag, hashtag MSBI tweets. And then I have no problem with you using your phones. I can't really see you. So <laughs> feel free to use your phones during the presentation. Um, I'm going to start off just by letting you get to know me a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my med Twitter origin story. And I started using Twitter first in 2011. And I have been sort of on Facebook since the beginning. Um, when you have you have to have like a college account, a college um, email address to register for Facebook. So that was back in like 2000. I don't know, one, <laughs> something like that. Um, and so this was my first attempt at using Twitter. I kind of messed up the hashtag a little bit, but you can see that I tried to tweet there. And then I'm, I'm totally Twittering or tweeting or twitting. I was still sort of learning the lingo. Um, and then for a while, the only two things that I would tweet about was March Madness and the Grammys. So it was like the one year, one night a year I would tweet is the Grammys. And then I would follow sort of March Madness and all the bracket things that were going on. Um, and then I started using it and transitioning it to a more professional account. So um, at a conference one year, I realized that a lot of people were tweeting about the different sessions that they had gone to and it really added to my conference experience. Um, I didn't, I was, I felt like I was missing out on a whole bunch of sessions that I really wanted to go to and having to pick between all of these, this awesome content. And it was a great way for me to be able to experience some of that content by people tweeting out their key points that they had learned from those different sessions. So that's really when it started transitioning to a professional account for me. Um, and then I was trying to figure out how to use Twitter in new and different ways at my own institution. And one of the things that I worked in pretty early on in my career was uh, quality and patient safety. I still do a little bit of that stuff as well. But um, we were running a project on how to reduce uh, morning labs on our, our rounding team. So uh, we were doing these run charts and I would just kind of post them on Twitter and the hashtag was uh, QI in real time. And I, so that, that's how I met this, this uh, person, Rebecca Jaffe. So she, we were kind of mutual fangirls of each other, um, as it were. And so that then we met on Twitter first, and then we met in real life. Um, and, and there's a hashtag for that too. So it's M-O-T-T-I-R-L. Um, <laughs> so I got to meet her at AIM Week in 2017. And we, um, along with a couple of other people, started talking about, well, how do we get this message out that this is useful? Um, so we decided to do a workshop. Um, and this is the workshop where I turned into an emoji, but um, it really was a great workshop at AIM Week in 2019 in Philadelphia, where we got to present um, different ways that you could use Twitter in medical education. So this is how I sort of became an expert and I've collaborated with a couple of these people on different projects. So 
Um, I do want to start off with a moment of gratitude, though, and I, I got this off, off of Twitter from the great Grady doctor, Dr. Kimberly Manning. Um, I'm just so thankful for the people that I've been able to meet and work with um, doing this, and I hope it speaks to how um, Twitter can really build your network outside of your own um, institution. So I'm hoping that you see that um, just from the way that I've been able to uh, uh, do that. So. I'm very thankful for those ladies and Kimberly Manning as well. And I'm also thankful, and I think this is probably how you got my name. I don't know for sure, but um, before COVID, well, actually kind of at the very beginning of COVID, I filmed uh, or I, I recorded a session with the Curbsiders Live. So this was pre um, any travel restrictions in February um, and that they, they uh, released it in April sometime. So uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm covering is actually in there too. So if you want to just skip this and go to the podcast, I'm okay with that too. But uh, I'll cover a little bit different information um, in this session as well. So, uh, so that's my background. So now we'll start with Twitter 101, the epidemiology, anatomy and physiology. And I'll start off with the definition of uh, social media. So websites and applications that enable users to create and share content or to participate in social networking. And there are a lot of avenues for this. Um, we, I used this as well on the podcast, but basically the donut explanation, you know, if you're on Instagram, it's here's a photo of my donut and it might be like a vintage photo or something like that. Facebook, I like donuts. Um, and then Twitter has always been with the hashtags and I'll explain more about hashtags a little bit later. Um, we do have to take a moment of silence for the Google Plus that didn't make it past 2019. Um, so RIP Google Plus that was only being used by Google employee, employees mainly. And I do want to stop and just say that this is sort of an ethnocentric um, view, sort of a Western view of social media. Um, if you're at different parts of the world, your social media internet donut thing might look a lot different than, than this. Um, in terms of who's using social media around the world, so over half of the world uses social media and most of those people are using it on their phone. So about 99% access it via mobile devices. And social media use is increasing by age. So um, this is from the Pew Research Centers from 2019, but um, still relevant today. Uh, not necessarily growing faster among the younger population, the 18 to 29 year old adults, uh, sort of growing among all, all age groups. Um, still the 65 plus are the, the lowest users, but you can see that they've also achieved gro uh, pretty good growth during the last couple of years as well. And then the platforms that are most popular, so Twitter remains sort of in this 20, 25% range, not a lot of people using it. Um, Facebook has always, as sort of the original one, has always been the most popular. And then YouTube, um, as much as it's a social media platform, is also a pretty popular place to watch videos. Um, and then you can see that sort of the rest of them. And are physicians using social media sites? And uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> so about 90% of physicians use social media for personal use. And another, um, and some of those same physicians, about 70% of physicians use social media for professional use. And I kind of have my social media um, separated a little bit. So I use Facebook and Instagram mainly for personal type things. And Twitter is really a professional account that I um, try and maintain that way. Um, and now to get in a little bit to the anatomy of Twitter and kind of what I, uh, part of what the talk is about. So this is actually the first time in a talk that I'm referencing myself. So, <laughs> and I don't know if that's a faux pas or not, but um, nobody stopped me so far. So uh, hopefully it's okay. But um, this is out of an article that I wrote with Dr. O'Glasser and Dr. Jaffe um, that we published in the seminars in nephrology this past May, I think, or May or June. Um, and that's me tweeting about Neph Madness. Um, and so me, that's my username and Twitter handle. Um, and then I have a profile picture to let you know who I am. And then also have a mention, which is also what we call a handle. And then hashtags and a link. And then I also put 
an image there. Um, the important thing about images is that uh, if you just put words on Twitter, less people look at that or view it. Um, if you put an image there, more people are going to slow down and look at your, your tweet. And then there's areas to interact with that tweet, so likes, retweets, and replies. Then I'll go into this a little bit more. Um, so here's a tweet from Mount Sinai Beth Israel, internal medicine. Um, you guys have your own handle there. And they identify an individual or organizational account. So there's there's they're also tagging, I guess, your chair. Um, and um, they're talking about um, a recent article that he wrote. So uh, Dr. Weissman, good job there. And they also tag the journal that it was published in. And then the hashtags are telehealth, hashtag GIM, hashtag primary care, and hashtag IM. So if I click on Dr. Weissman's name for his handle, it leads me to his profile page where there's a nice picture and talks about his job. And so it looks like this is a, a professional account from what I can see um, on Twitter. And then if I actually tagged or um, clicked on one of those hashtags, it would bring up tweets that have the same hashtag. So I found out that there is a joint New England Mountain West combined regional conference for the Society of General Internal Medicine that way, and that you could register using that link. So uh, kind of a trail of breadcrumbs leading you down a pathway um, to other related content. Um, but a lot of what when we talk about Twitter and we talk about kind of how your tweets behave online, that's sort of the physiology of Twitter, right? So um, I like these three active verbs. So create, share, and participate. Um, and that actually formula formulated kind of our, our whole approach to the article that we wrote. So Twitter's a way to create content, share it with others, and participate in kind of this online uh, vibrant med Twitter community. Um, so here's another tweet. And I think I, I, you all would have to explain all the relationships to me. This is the, maybe the medical school at the same site um, or a sister site. And they were having a GME educational conference. So this is an example of a tweet. Um, and they're sharing some content with you. And then a sister site maybe retweeted that, um, and that's a simple retweet that just gets the information to more users, uh, more followers from that that's that account. And then um, you guys from Mount Sinai Beth Israel Internal Medicine, you retweeted it, but you did something called a quote tweet. So you t retweeted that, so it has the original tweet there, and then you added your own information and how excited you were. Um, so those are different ways that your tweet can behave on the on the Twitter space. Um, hopefully that all made sense. And maybe it's too simple, but um, I found some of you obviously saw from my origin story, some of it a little bit overwhelming when I first joined Twitter. Um, so why be active with social media? I think 60% um, of physicians say their most popular activity is just following what colleagues are sharing and discussing. Um, and so that brings us to kind of the meat of what I want to talk about and hopefully the most practical things for this talk, but is um, how to use Twitter in medical education. And you're probably familiar with the Bloom's taxonomy or the revised Bloom's taxonomy. So it's a way to create objectives and, and um, evaluate um, learners by moving them up on these uh, higher uh, skills. And we, we tried to modify that for um, social media. So I worked with Dr. Jaffe and again, Dr. Glasser and some other people on this modified Bloom's taxonomy for social media. And if you're following on Twitter, I'll have all these references kind of linked there um, throughout the talk. So. Um, consume, uh, like we were, I was talking about earlier, physicians mostly look at what people are discussing um, online on social media. Um, and that's sort of the base part of the, the pyramid. And then um, looking into moving people up on the pyramid is how can we get people to start sharing their own content, tweeting and retweeting. Um, including personal and program achievements or promoting different things like their program or their, their, their personal accounts. Um, 
moving even further up on the taxonomy, discussing things, and then eventually creating um, even more collaborations and content. So my whole goal is to try and move you up from just consuming if you're already on Twitter um, to a little bit higher um, goals there. Um, but I do want to say that consuming is not a bad place to start. So using Twitter and meta, this is what I, this is how I started as I just started following other medical ed educators and seeing what they were doing at other sites. Um, at VCU, a lot of us that I work with and as hospitalists, we all kind of graduated from here. So it's always nice to have some outside opinions and some outside um, just different ways to do things. So one, um, one way that you can consume information is to just follow that hashtag or I have a good handle for you to follow, um, especially if you're kind of a newer faculty or a junior faculty. Um, and that's the meta twag team. Um, so it's like a tag team because there's two of them, but twag because they're on Twitter. So there's a lot of TW stuff on Twitter. Um, and they create the, this content that um, walks you through kind of setting expectations for your teams. There's all kinds of giving feedback advice and different things that they post almost every, every week um, that can help you be a better medical educator. Um, one way that I like using Twitter and MedEd is, is just taking a time out. So um, I actually posted something this morning. It's a, it's a hashtag post it pearl. And I like this because even if your students or residents don't want to be on social media, anyone can really do this, which is just to make, um, take a patient and take something they learned and bring it to rounds and share it with the group. And a, a post-it limits you um, in terms of time so that it will be kind of a quick but high yield learning point. Um, and then I think I try and do this uh, or try and get my students to do this so we can all be teaching each other. And like I said, it really doesn't require you to be on social media, but you can take a picture of it and post it on Twitter. And then you've made your work count twice and you're sharing it with a lot of other users. So this is an example of one that I did. Um, I talked about the PESIT trial at some point last time I was on Wards and how you can't spell syncope without PE, which I, I don't, I did not make up that joke at all and I can't figure out who did and I would love to be able to give them credit. So if anybody knows who did a workshop on on Pezit a couple years ago, I would love to be able to credit, credit them with that. And I also tagged some of my, my residents and my med students. Um, we have a resident here who's been doing it and I don't know if he's doing it on days off, but um, he's been doing some post-it pearls of when to, this one's when to consider doing a right-sided EKG. And then I had a student do one just on the causes of vertigo. So you can see it's a sort of just a way to get some high yield facts there. Another way you can use Twitter and MedEd, and this is also sort of a, a, on the promotion, I tried to make these color coded, uh, this green promotion um, on the taxonomy is to, is to tweet a tutorial. And, um, I think of this kind of as your online chalk talk, and that's what a lot of it is for me. So um, I have this, this, uh, this content that I put together based on a workshop that I saw at hospital medicine one year on COPD. And I can actually bring that up. Um, and I've linked all the tweets and talk about it with students. It takes about 10 minutes to go through all the content. And we talk about things like, um, azithromycin and COPD and some of the, the different medicines that we use. And so um, Tony Brew actually was the one who thought up all this. So he has a lot of tutorials that explain interesting physiology. And there's other people that are creating content like this, where it's basically like a mini um, lecture almost. There's also um, linked tweets that create kind of the narrative in medicine that are, are fun to follow as well. Um, so a tip for this is just to convert a topic you typically teach into something online and then you have access to it every time you're on wards, which is kind of nice. And you, and you can log in to Twitter at my institution from any computer. So I have access to it wherever I go pretty much. So, so this is an example of a tutorial of why doesn't the stomach digest itself. Um, and he went way back and found, you know, manuscripts from 1772. There's a polling 
um, feature in Twitter that allows you to poll the audience for a set number of days. And so um, he, he employed that. That's a pretty good technique and that's good for adult learning theory as well, these mini tests and questions. Um, and then you can see that he's added lots of pictures. So this one shows that the gastric acid's corrosive because it's eaten through a, a razor blade there. So just kind of interesting and then kind of getting eventually to the answer, which I'll let you find out online. Another way you can use Twitter in medical education is to ask a question. And um, I do this, uh, I just put up my question for the day because I'm currently clinically um, working and I pose the question about um, met hemoglobinemia, which we happen to see on our, our service recently. So um, there's different accounts you can do this from, or you could create a hashtag and just do it that way. Um, and I try and ask clinical questions that have some element of ambiguity. I don't like to ask sort of yes, no questions or even multiple choice questions, because what I'm trying to do is, is spark debate. And there, again, is, um, an adult learning theory that kind of goes along with discussion-based um, teaching. So you can also partner with your library and um, Dr. Jaffe at Jefferson does a good job with that of involving her library and they, they will look up references for them as well. And so trying to push residents and learners beyond up to date to the actual literature. And so this is an example of question in, of the day in action. So this is my account Nestler question of the day. We have our, our ward rounding teams are the Nestler teaching teams. So um, when I was on team five, first question, we talked a little bit about dress this morning. Um, and so I asked a few different questions about dress. Is there a di diagnostic schema or criteria for dress? Um, I did the hashtag med ed. This was a, a gif or a gif, I really don't know how that's pronounced, um, of kind of Homer wearing a dress. So uh, try to be a little, incorporate a little bit of humor. And then my two medical students responded and I was really impressed with what they found. So they, they went not just to up to date, but to um, the literature and found the registrar uh, criteria and they found um, another reference. Look, she put, uh, Kimberly put the PMID, which is really nice. And I don't know if you can tell, but this is me interacting with them at 8.45 p.m., 8.47 p.m. They've already answered the question. I get to interact with them outside of rounds and um, spur learning. And then the next day we talked about it as a team and the students could teach the rest of the team. Um, Another way you can use Twitter, again, sort of moving up on this taxonomy, um, so discussion-based, is, is to chat about it. Um, and this is, I started participating in one chat, the um, Journal of Hospital Medicine chat back in 2016. It was a little bit overwhelming at first, um, but moving forward, I've been able to um, really participate that and grow community that way. So. There's um, all kinds of journal clubs and chats that ask different questions. Um, some of them may be based on an, an article or literature that everybody's chatting about, or it could be a topic um, such as women in medicine or um, medical education techniques and strategies. Um, so the questions vary, but usually there's about three or four questions in a chat, and then everybody sort of takes 10 to 20 minutes of answering those. Um, and you can also view them asynchronously, which is nice. So if I miss the JHM chat, I can follow the hashtag and see what they, they were talking about the night before. I live on the East Coast, and sometimes the, the chats are West Coast times, so um, it doesn't always work out for me to stay up real late. So. And this is just examples of the, a, a Twitter chat. So this is a Journal of Hospital Medicine and they make their, if they're discussing an article, they make it available for free. Um, and they also offer CME for their chats as well, an hour of CME if you participate the whole hour. Um, and they just were advertising and this is the moderator that introduced herself and some of the other um, women physicians that were guests and 
this is an example of a question and then how um, people interact with that. So what's been the most challenging part about being a woman in medicine during COVID-19 pandemic? The childcare, I think a lot of us can relate to that. And then sort of the unknown of the school calendar um, and then having emotional energy to deal with it. Um, so I think um, chatting about different topics and articles is a great way to network and grow your community um, online. And then um, just at the top is creating spaces. Um, so creating a hashtag or um, something to, uh, for others to, to engage. So one way, one example of this is this, this hashtag tips for new docs, which allowed the attendings to um, interact with uh, incoming interns. Um, so they get advice from all across the country, from their peers, from seasoned faculty. Um, and it was a great way for people to help alleviate that sort of deer in the headlight look of July 1st. Um, and there were some great tips. So again, from Dr. Manning, um, you know, work hard at building relationships with your interprofessional team. Um, and that's great advice. I, I don't think I always understood that day one when I was coming into to residency. Um, and Dr. Ray, um, this was great advice that I haven't used yet, but I'm really excited about for my next chest x-ray that has something on it. So I always forget if it's right or left um, and where the infiltrate is. And so I, the, his tip was to draw it out on your notes. And I think that's a great tip and I'm gonna use it the next time I have a, a pneumonia. Um, and then we created this taxonomy and we, I think we presented it like two years ago almost. Um, and then we wrote about it and it took a while to get published. And then I, th I think there's probably a star on top of this tree of educating, so mentoring your learners and how to use social media professionally or um, in a medical education sort of way. And Adam Rodman did this. And so um, he had, I guess they had been talking about the BNP on rounds and then he had a student um, sort of research it and then the the student sent an email back to the team and then Adam worked with him to cr create that email, um, to turn that email into a tutorial. And when you talk about impact for a student, so the student went from sharing the information with, you know, maybe four to seven people on an inpatient team to over 50,000 people seeing it and then over 3,000, uh, you know, almost 3,000 people interacting with it. Um, and I, I think that's just amazing. So. I think people who do this with their students are, are at the top of that um, taxonomy for sure. Um, and I already alluded to sort of making your work count twice. Uh, I got an iPad and an Apple Pencil and I've been kind of playing around with that. And then I um, posted some of the things that I had done during the week that week and like 300 people liked it. And I, I think a lot of us are, um, trying to find new and different ways to engage with our learners. And I think uh, Twitter can help us, you know, at least give us ideas sometimes. Um, and then in terms of scholarship, uh, I already alluded that I had um, some manuscripts that had come out as a result of my time on Twitter, but your traditional output me metrics were, you know, you got a journal, people were mailed that journal, they read it, um, they discussed it. They had subscribers to the journal, citations, downloads, or an impact factor. But um, social media-based out output metrics are just a little bit different. And so I think we're, in the coming years, we're gonna have to really consider how um, these alt metrics, alternative metrics, uh, in terms of followers, tweets, likes, the reach of the article and impressions, is it, I think that's gonna become more and more important. Um, one thing I was thinking about uh, before I put the, together this talk was just um, like how many people read your article. <laughs> uh, and I've heard that it's like usually you and the people that work on your article and then maybe the reviewers and that's it. Um, most articles have like less than 10 um, downloads. And so this is one way if you have an article that you're proud of, you can get it out on social media. 
and maybe uh, reach more, make a little bit more of an impact. Um, and then they've done some work looking and seeing if uh, tweets can predict if your work is cited. And um, there's actually a correlation, so a tweetation factor that highly tweeted articles are 11 times more likely to be cited. And then if you actually look at the top cited articles, you can predict if they were tweeted, um, some of the top tweeted articles with 93% specificity and 75% sensitivity. So just some interesting data. Um, I mentioned about disseminating your articles. Um, a good way to do that is with a visual abstract. And so um, this is a very meta tweet about a visual abstract about a study that was looking at visual abstracts. So you can see that visual abstracts increase the amount of Im impressions, retweets, and then really the, the final product were, were people actually visiting that article and, and downloading it. Um, so that is Twitter and MedEd. Um, and I'm gonna sort of change gears and talk a little bit more about community building. Um, so social media and under, undergraduate medical education. So there's a, a vast um, network of medical students who are using social media, not just Twitter, but um, Instagram, all of the platforms. And um, a lot of them are using it to um, build their network. Um, they're also learning from these platforms in terms of health related content. Um, and they get access to a variety of specialists and people who are experts in the field and they also have a voice um, so they're able to ask their questions and that is um, from work done in 2011 by um, Catherine Cretion and so um, they that those two words getting access and voice um, for people who um, traditionally have not had that I think is one of the really um, excellent benefits of social media. Um, Twitter has also been uh, sort of heralded as, as flattening hierarchies. So um, I interact with a lot of students on Twitter, um, feel like they feel free to ask me questions a lot of times. Um, and networking is an easy benefit. So I, I recently have put all my stuff together for a promotion to associate professor and a lot of the people that I asked as referees, um, I've met on Twitter or I've met them in real life and you know, formed better relationships via Twitter. So um, I ascribe to something called mission-based tweeting. So I have a really clear reason why I'm on Twitter. Um, I do some personal learning, uh, not a lot anymore, but um, most of what I'm trying to do is find med ed content and find uh, other people who are interested in translating um, traditional things like chalk talks into more um, online techniques and things like that. Um, I'm on it for networking and community building and then I'm on it for promoting residency programs and division and, scholar and our department. Um, I haven't had a ton of scholarship to disseminate, but I'm working more into that arena. And then advocacy is something that I think is important for all physicians. It was not originally why I joined Twitter, so I'm still working that into my mission. Um, but I, I always go back to these things if I've ever um, confused as to why I'm even on Twitter anymore. Um, and so can you build your community online and then can it translate into something else? So we've had tweet ups at conferences and then um, I think when one day when we were pretty all pretty down during COVID, somebody set up a virtual happy hour via Zoom and it was great to just see people in person, well, you know, virtually in person and chat um, and not think about work for a little while. So I think uh, these relationships have proved um, very beneficial for me. I also am so proud of the work our residency program has done to um, increase their presence online. So last year I had um, a chief resident who was very interested in how to expand the residence learning networks. And then um, 
one of the things that we saw was just that uh, Twitter makes our program feel smaller and closer as uh, the residents get to see the thoughts and responses of upper levels and attendings. And I think that's um, true of our program. I think we view each other all as colleagues and team members rather than there being a, a very hierarchical structure at our program. Um, I love following the residents. I don't know that they love it all that much, but <laughs> um, we have such talented people. So this is one of our EMIM residents and she was reflecting on her last year and her intern year. And um, she EM side, so there's, I don't know, it, this might not be ubiquitous, but she did draw a turkey sandwich, which I have worked at a couple of different ERs in Louisiana and Virginia, and it's always been a thing that that's a thing in the ER. So I like that she included that. Um, so you can see that she's um, talented and interesting, and I think if I was a fellowship director and I saw this online, I would be very interested in her as a candidate. And um, I love hearing back from residents who <laughs> graduated from our program. And so this resident actually graduated from our program and she wrote that, I think the hidden purpose of me going to VCU was to learn ways of approaching medical education that are designed to bridge the traditional with the contemporary and invite more discussion. Um, and I have a few references for if you're thinking about uh, building your community and um, tweeting as a residency program, there's some very practical tips in these two references um, for how to do that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about physician advocacy, and this is something that I just recently moved into, so I'm not an expert at this. Um, but I do think it's important for our, our profession to realize the full potential of our expertise. Um, and I, think that that was very true in terms of a lot of the things that have happened recently with um, COVID. I love these quotes from Don Berwick about the work of a healer cannot stop at the door of an office, the threshold of an operating room, or the front gate of a hospital, and that prof professional silence in the face of social injustice is wrong. Um, so how can physicians advocate on social media? Um, I liked also this quote from Dr. Mona Hannah Atisha. So the doctor in front of my name was a megaphone for the kids of Flint. So she was the doctor that brought the issues with the water um, to light. I used it and I became the voice of health. Um, so there's several different things um, in terms of patients and public health. Uh, vaccine safety is one, climate change. Uh, gun violence, maybe just educating people about masks. That's one way that you can advocate or be an advocate. Um, for our profession, recently there was a big um, change to step one, making it pass fail. And there, I remember for many months before that, many people using the hashtag, you know, make step one pass fail. <laughs> uh, I think that was pretty successful to advocate for that. And then on an individual level, you can definitely promote yourself and then self-advocacy, you know, great way. So the, so VCU's, um, their VCU Health Twitter handle mainly um, is trying to educate patients and the public. So if you look at their Twitter handle, they have a lot of links to, or they'll post some videos and a lot of them are educational. And this one is, a advocating to get your flu vaccine this year. Um, in terms of advocating for the profession, you may have seen um, this New Yorker cover and then the many, many pictures that came in afterwards of people re recreating that New Yorker cover. Um, and this is really like a women in medicine thing. So um, all of the surgeons there being female. And there are, obviously COVID specific things that we've had to advocate for and a lot of people have done that online. So get me PPE was a very um, trending hashtag. And then personally, just advertising. I love that Dr. Manning put that she is um, the 270th uh, full professor um, 
as a black woman. And I love that she is uh, bringing more people with her. So being the pipeline for future um, black women in medicine. And there's been several articles that have touched on this, but um, women physicians continue to face many barriers in promotion and compensation, speaking opportunities, recognition, awards, and more, and that social media may provide us with opportunities that previous generations lacked. Um, and I think that's been true for me. I, I love that I've been able to reach more people just by my um, having an online presence. I do want to touch on um, professionalism. So um, responsible social media use. I, I think my best advice for you is to know what your institution guidelines are. So know thy institutional guidelines and to uphold the standards of your institution. Um, I do this little workshop with the, usually the interns in the second years as they transition to their second year and third year. So the transition sessions and we talked a lot about um, why you wouldn't want to post things that could be construed as negative about your work or your institution. Um, I think it's one thing to share something that's hard and to empathize with others about that. And, but there's ways to do that and being careful with your wording that doesn't reflect negatively on your institution. Um, and I like the advice to tweet as if your mother will read this, because I um, often think about my mom <laughs> uh, reading what I'm going to write. And then I, I saw this online recently, and I really think this is what responsible social media use is um, for me. Would I be okay if this was the only thing a person ever knew about me, this one tweet? Um, because people will judge you for that one tweet. Even if it's deleted, people take screenshots and Twitter never forgets, trust me, like it, they'll find the information somehow. <laughs> um, so don't tweet angry, <laughs> uh, make sure that you are, are using it responsibly. Um, I also should probably talk a little bit about patient confidentiality. So uh, be sure to post the pearl, not the patient, and I have to attribute that to Avi, again, um, it's great advice. So we're used to case-based learning where we, you know, we start off with a traditional 57-year-old woman with, you know, sickle cell disease, et cetera, comes in with this. Um, and a lot of people have been tweeting that way, like tweeting the entire case. I think what I'm doing more and more is trying to switch from that and think through like what's the take-home point for this and then backtrack that way can i can i get that point across without posting any information um, any potential and identifying information about the patient um, i think you can be very hipaa compliant on twitter and still have ways that people will be able to triangulate the information and figure out who that patient is, especially if it's a rare disease, a young patient. Um, like if you say a 24-year-old is hospitalized today, I mean, that already, a 24-year-old man hospitalized, there's already three pieces of information um, that can narrow that patient down considerably. Um, so learning how to do this as well. I um, recently had a conversation on Twitter with another provider about this and um, he actually agreed that there was probably too much information in the case that was that he had um, presented and so he ended up taking that case down. Um, and it was actually a great teachable moment, moment for both of us. I had kind of debated about whether I should give feedback on it but I just felt uncomfortable with how much information was actually being shared online. All right, I have six minutes about, so I'm gonna speed through the last topic of Twitter in the time of coronavirus. Um, so I mentioned earlier that this donut view is probably kind of a Western view. If you look, um, so obviously coronavirus originated in Wuhan, China, and the social media climate in China is completely different than what it is in the US. There, um, a lot of users use a few, social sites, but one of them is called WeChat, and it's basically like 
all of the social media sites in one app. Um, you can pay through it. You can make appointments with your doctor through it. Um, and all of that data is being tracked and also regulated, monitored, and sometimes censored by the Chinese government. Um, the Chinese government has very strict laws in place that if you have a social media site um, that's being, um, you know, downloaded in China, it has to have ways for them to intervene on the content. Um, and I think this tweet from Rebecca, because I'm just a fan girl, girl of her in general, but um, really describes what I was thinking about the first six weeks of the pandemic. So especially in recent weeks, I can't say enough about the power of social media to educate at scale. Um, you can reach so many more people this way um, with really good content. Um, so Nick Mark um, over, I think he's on the West Coast somewhere, um, very early on had some patients with COVID and was, had created this one pager, has all the information on it, and has updated it several times as new information becomes available um, and made it available online for free. And he's tracking, you know, how many people are downloading it, et cetera. But um, amazing work on, and I don't think, and this was available very early on, like probably before we had our first case in the ICU. Um, I think that reach is incredible. Um, here's some on uh, the pathophys or the pathology and physiology of why we can do prone positioning in COVID, um, which was published uh, online in, in March. Um, and then one thing that I really appreciated was COVID preparation. So part of, part of what I did during COVID was try and figure out how we were going to um, redeploy people if we needed to, our surge preparations, where, what, would we, what would we do with medicine residents? What would we do with other residents? How could we get a psychiatry or surgical resident up to speed in the medicine department? So I turned to Twitter and people were posting all kinds of great things, um, both clinical things, like um, I think this was a clinical thing for acute care. Um, and then this was a, a residency program that, to, that posted sort of practical tips, like get people trained in the correct way to don and doff PPE now <laughs> before you actually have to do it. Uh, I think that was very valuable advice, and uh, we started doing that before we um, hit sort of our peak of the virus, which I don't know if we've hit the peak yet, but keep keeping our fingers crossed. Um, this is actually a website that I felt like kind of arose overnight, so Pediatric Overflow Planning Contingency Response Network, so Popcorn Network, and I'm still using this website because they have all kinds of one-pagers, like this Gen Med rounding one-pager of, like, how do you get a, a pediatrician to round on a medical person? They're probably the best people to do this because it's probably pretty similar to what they do, but um, really good and practical information. And I'm still, like I said, I'm still using that website. Um, and then I really think that Twitter in the time of Corona, um, we really, as physicians online, created the narrative. Um, and nobody did this better than Dr. Manning. She had uh, several stories. Um, this first story actually she goes through and talks about all her emotions, um, including some guilt, because she I don't think she was on the front lines at that time. Um, but thinking through like how do physicians process things? And it was very therapeutic for me to read because I was having a lot of those similar emotions. And the second thread was about one of her um, friends um, who happened to have shortness of breath during this. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about COVID misinformation. Obviously, um, one of the criticisms of social media is that it's not peer reviewed, um, but apparently sometimes journal articles aren't either. So this I think was peer reviewed in less than a day. It had also hit the internet um, a lot sooner because of some preprint um, things. And so, um, but the talk about it on Twitter was, you know, 
are all the COVID articles going to be like this? Like, we need the information, but we need accurate information. We're sort of doing this post-publication journal club on these articles online. And it sort of blew our minds a little bit because, again, that's been the critique of social media is that it's not peer-reviewed, but then we're basically performing peer-reviewed for some of these articles. And the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to stop, I promise, um, in time for questions, is uh, social media presence for residency programs. So um, if you think about trying to figure out as a student, put, your, put yourself in the place of a student interviewing this year, and you're not going to visit anywhere, um, and they're all Zoom interviews, like how, are you, how is your residency going to highlight their program? And I think social media presence, um, which again, I'm so grateful for our chiefs last year who kind of increased our digital footprint. Um, but thinking through forward thinking a past this year, things that you may wanna ask for are good web designers, something in the budget for a social media manager and somebody to, to do your videos for your, um, for your social media. I think that is gonna be super important moving forward. Um, and like they say, this generation tends to be on this space a lot more often than we do. We do. And then again, there's another ref reference that you can say, but social media, I think, is going to play an increasingly important role in the resident recruitment. So should you be on Twitter? Yeah, short, short story is yes. I, I hope I've convinced you. And then um, that's my key points slide, and I'm going to stop one minute late. And I will take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. That was fascinating. I'll let people uh, either unmute to ask questions or enter them in the chat box uh, just to keep the conversation going. We have about eight more minutes. Um, maybe I'll start by asking you, I, I'm glad you raised the issue about, um, about medical students. And we've been thinking a lot about how to engage with medical students. Um, and you know, one of the concerns was an article that we read a couple of years ago, so it's already pretty out of date, but that looked at sort of a distinction between the faculty who are predominantly on Twitter um, and students who are predominantly on a bunch of other things like uh, maybe Instagram or uh, now maybe more TikTok or something. And so people who thought they were communicating weren't necessarily communicating. So I just wanted to get a little bit of a sense of how you feel like it's been going interacting with, with students and applicants and maybe more broadly on other platforms that, that could do some of the same work. Yeah, I think it's a tricky, it's obviously a balancing thing. Um, they mentioned kind of not following the, uh, the students back. Um, so students may choose to follow you on Instagram or Twitter, but like maintaining sort of that professional distance for your program. Um, so I think that's one way. Um, I follow a few medical students just because they're interesting and in posting. I want to actually see what students are tweeting about. So I kind of follow a few. Um, I think, yeah, <laughs> I think it's, it's a balance of trying to figure out um, you don't want to be like big brother, right? <laughs> uh, so um, the one way I've interacted recently with applicants, um, we did a Twitter chat on diversity, equity, and inclusion um, prior to our last re uh, recruiting year. So we did it in January and we set it up and we had different program representatives from the different programs, including surgery. So it was GME wide um, and we did we did a Twitter chat just talking about how VCU is making efforts and that, and that went well. We had a few applicants, you know, log in for that. Um, I think it'll be even more attended this year if we try, if we do it again. So I think there's ways to kind of set up times um, for applicants to view your program. Um, I think Oregon State did a virtual, like, here we are, <laughs> this is us. And it was timed and everything for applicants to get to kind of a walkthrough of their program. Does that answer your question? I'm having a hard time with the question, so uh, not everything's coming across completely. Um, so chat might be better, actually, if I can Perfect. get the Dr. chat Dr. Berger up. looks like he's unmuted. Maybe he has a question. Yeah, I, I do have a question. I think this was a great talk, and thank you very much. And we, for that reason, through the official account, 
unless somebody sort of says they'd like us to follow them while people are in the program, we do not follow anyone. Sometimes we follow some of the graduates um, who are very active or who we are also trying to help promote because they're self-promoting. Um, but one of the things that has come up within the last year around students and for any students on the, on the watching, um, you know, I, this question sort of for you or, you know, to try and help you navigate this difficult world where we talk about, we promote advocacy, but then there's some rhetoric that sometimes comes with advocacy where people can, um, while well-intentioned, perhaps use terms or, or statements or align themselves with uh, somebody or a group that maybe is uh, uh, pushing a, a boundary around the rhetoric that has caused, we've seen um, more at the college level than the med student level, but you could find yourself um, in this if, if we continue to push advocacy, you know, find themselves having job offers rescinded or in the middle of a sort of press storm. Um, what would your advice be? I think you did cover some of it, but is specifically to students thinking about this because they're already, they're in a very vulnerable place, particularly applying for residencies or other opportunities. So I will say there's a higher percentage of students that are anonymous on Twitter. So whereas I have my name and my degrees out there, you, you have literally anonymous med student account following you. Um, so I think that's one way that they try and protect themselves is to remain anonymous until they've kind of had uh, matched or figured out where their residency program is. Um, for those that are not anonymous, um, a lot of them are very clear about what they're interested in programs. And so I think if they were trying to match at a program and that program didn't match them because of something they said, say about Black Lives Matter or something, that would have not been a good fit anyway for them. Um, so uh, the way I advise them is that if it's a it is a platform for you to advocate for different um, social injustice type things, I still make sure that you're proud of what you're saying. And then if that's a, you know, very important to you, look to see if you can match that if, if your residency program is matching the amount of passion that you have for that. Um, so I think that's good advice for anyone. Um, if, you're, if that's part of your value system, so I've always been really big on figuring out what your values are, um, then make sure that the residency program you're going to has that same values set, I guess. All right, we've got time for maybe yep. one more question. I did not know that Grace used to be at um, Mount Sinai West, so <laughs> I'll have to tell her the next time I chat with her. <laughs> Absolutely, that would be great. There's one uh, Instagram of me somewhere, you know, of when I did Grand Rounds over there. So it's, uh, it's fun nice. to get to see her online. So maybe I'll ask about promotions. I mean, you talked a little bit about your own promotion, but I'm sort of curious if you, you know, we certainly expect people as they get promoted here to have uh, national and international recognition. Do you have a sense of whether schools broadly are using uh, Twitter following as, or social media following as a metric of, of international and national recognition? So the last part didn't quite come through, but I think you're asking about what um, digital content you know, schools are using for promotion criteria. And I think um, I added something about digital media and how I use it to my CV. And there's actually a white paper on that that I can tweet out later um, on how you can kind of structure your CV to um, either highlight something unique that you've done on Twitter, a tutorial or something like that, the impact that it has, and then kind of the reach. Um, there's also places to think about adding podcasts and other forms of digital media. I think more and more programs are taking that to account and I think they're going to have to <laughs> because not a lot of people are going to be traveling for Grand Rounds much anymore. Um, I'm just grateful that you guys were able to accommodate me today. This has been great. So 
Um, but yeah, I think the, like you said, it, it sort of adds to your, you know, regional, national reach um, if your work is being used somehow digitally. And I think more and more programs are going to have to figure out how they evaluate that and take that into account. All right, we finished right on time, one o'clock. Dr. Brooks, thank you so much. And I have a feeling we're going to be continuing this conversation uh, with all of us online. Thank you. Take care. I had so much fun. Thanks.